Welcome to the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast. I'm Robert Boynton. This episode of The Vault is from November 17, 2012, when the Institute held a day-long symposium in which playwrights, poets, scientists, philosophers, artists, and activists discussed the phenomenon of solitary confinement. Titled, Should You Ever Happen to Find Yourself in Solitary, Wry Fancies and Stark Realities, the event was the brainchild of Lawrence Weschler, the Institute's director. In this installment, we meet photographer Catherine Chalmers, whose photographs of insects take place at the intersection of art, science, and nature. Her books include Food Chain, Encounters with Mates, Predators, and Prey, and American Cockroach. Then we hear from Carl Skelton, the founding director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center and a professor at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Finally, we hear from the film and sound editor Walter Murch, who has won three Academy Awards and edited all three Godfather movies. In a second, we're going to have how you could befriend a bug. Catherine, can you help us befriend a bug? Oh, I'll try. Okay, befriending a bug. Are we ever really alone? if we consider the ubiquity of the invertebrates. Flies, spiders, ants, and cockroaches, all could easily come and go through the cracks of a prison cell, as if they were freeways, challenging the very notion of solitary. But would a bug offer companionship and therefore comfort? Or would their presence incite further terror to a confined individual? What are the physical and behavioral characteristics of an arthropod? that might influence these opposite reactions. Take the fly, for example. Their incessant buzzing, always out of reach, small, quick, hard to kill, could drive anyone mad. We loathe them for spreading disease and for their larvae eating us when we die. But if a fly was your only companion, could you see it in another light? The same dramas of the human world, birth, sex, predation, war, and death, play out in the insect world. They're just on a smaller scale and take more patience to observe. Flies have earned their moniker, they breed like flies. And to do that, they have a lot of sex. They put on a veritable mini porn show. That might entertain a sex-starved prisoner. This is a male getting ready to mate, classic sex, creative sex, two males and a female, a female spreading her legs and wings after she has had multiple partners, birth, and the ravages of old age. Humans tend to like animals with eyes. The bigger, the rounder, the better. We certainly prefer eyes to antenna. Two legs are better than four, which is usually preferable to six, and no doubt for most people, superior to eight. Besides having too many legs, spiders don't even have heads. And most importantly, they don't have eyes that we can look into and relate to. Most spiders have an eye cluster mounted on a torso. Their morphology offers little opportunity for traditional engagement and companionship. But they make art. Orb weavers even make and remake their art daily changing a solitary confinement cell into a spider's studio. Webs are beautiful by any definition of art, gossamer, delicate, intricate, and composed. They are three-dimensional sculptures hanging in space. Who cares about a spider's lack of expression when their web it spins is a masterpiece of expression? It's difficult to befriend a bug if you cannot be certain to whom you are speaking. One fly is hard to distinguish from another, but spiders have a home address. If you call your new friend Charlotte, you can be fairly certain you are still talking to her the next day if her web is in the same general location. And Charlotte's art is lethal. If your cell has both a fly and a spider, you are in for a glorious performance of nature's ability to spin life into a dizzying ball of death. Perhaps an isolated human being might embrace the chance to spend time with another species with whom we share our unique socialness. Ants are a sophisticated social species with complex communication, organized division of labor. They are master chemists and accomplished architects. Ants invented a network 
communication system that rivals the internet. Without central command, individual antenna touches are like Google hits. Complex decisions are made. Ant conversation is not top down, but bottom up, not command and control, but connect and collaborate. At some point, a message goes viral. Leave some food for the ants, and those antenna touches will communicate a message to come visit you. To feed and care for another being, or hundreds of beings, has proven health and emotional benefits. But provide too great a bounty, and a rival colony might challenge for a place at your buffet. Is there a social species that doesn't engage in warfare? To incite an ant war is to see many gladiators locked in epic battle. I cannot imagine a creature more hated than the cockroach. The word itself is an insult in many languages. But on what is this based? They don't bite or sting or carry the dangerous pathogens that flies and mice regularly do. There is nothing life-threatening about a cockroach. Would it be possible to put disgust aside and draw companionship from one of the world's most successful creatures? Getting past the dark, twitchy exterior, the roach is remarkably remark subtle and sculptural. Its wings are a glowing translucent amber, and its long, elegant antenna explore the world with the grace of a ballerina's arms. Even cockroaches, which are not defined as a social species, seek out each other's company. When they are kept in isolation, they have significantly reduced lifespans. Like us, they enjoy hanging out together when they drink and when they eat. Their molting is a magical moment of transformation. The roach walks up and down the wall to make sure it has enough room, then it hangs upside down and drops out of its old skin. The newly emerged roach is white and delicate and soft. Cockroach sex lasts for nearly an hour. The female mates once, consequently is quite choosy, and then is pregnant for life. But maybe you are buying none of this. For some people, solitary confinement is preferable to the company of insects. Then at least a bug could provide a rare opportunity for the expression of control over your environment as you chase it around the cell and simply squish it out of existence. Humans have been doing this for a very long time. Thank you. Catherine, just one question before you go away. You spend a lot of time with bugs, and a lot of the language you use is you get to watch them go to war, you get to, in other words, you do human projections onto bugs. Do you find yourself feeling more buggy? Does the projection go the other way around? I wouldn't say fortunately, that I feel buggy. But when I ordered my first batch of cockroaches and started raising them, I think it was two weeks straight where every dream I had, the characters in the dream, even though they were human personalities and the normal dramas of a dream, were all cockroaches. Mm -hmm. I only saw cockroaches. And most of them were flooding and escaping and terrifying me. And then when I went to the tropics for the first time to work with leafcutter ants, I saw ants flowing for about a week, and it took a long time to switch out of sort of the ant dumb back into the human mm -hmm. drama. I wonder in the context of somebody in solitaire, if they were befriending a bug, how their dreams would play out. Well, chances are you wouldn't have the sheer number that I did, and yeah, I think no, that's yeah, sure. what was so terrifying. And the cockroaches, because I was keeping them in terrariums, and I was terrified of them. The idea of them escaping, of course, was just the... the and you, uh, you know, a cockroach will come and go in a cell. It won't, it won't be, you know, yeah, yeah. in their numbers. Hmm. Thank you so much. Carl Skelton is going to tell us a story about another scientist. Hi, I'm Carl Skelton, and I'm a recovering academic. <laughs> I have worked as an artist, a community organizer, as the founding director of integrated digital media programs in a small independent engineering school, which is now a small dependent engineering school <laughs> of NYU, I found myself a year and a half ago running a joint research and development project with the Institute for Angewandte Medienforschung at the University of Bremen, which was a doctoral dissertation project involving distributed creative solutions to urban design and development issues, which is, of course, always a sporting proposition in New York. Looking at my fifth department head and provost in six years, 
a non-performing co-author on another book about experimental multimedia and realizing that if I wanted to get any work done, I was going to have to quit my job, which I did, actually. And my wife, to whom I shall be forever grateful for going along with this idea and for being happy about it after I made a pen of lasagna to celebrate my availability to domestic chores. I also, of course, am continuing with the getting done of the work, part of which, because one of the books was about experimental multimedia programming, which involved having to rethink a timeline of the development of these things outside the scope of the rather parochial histories that have been written of media, and along the way found myself browsing in the way that people browsed before you needed a computer to do it, and came across a guy who had to make much more complicated and extreme decisions, I guess, and got really terrific results. Roughly in 965 AD, a boy was born into a prominent family in Basra, and named Abu Ali al-Hassan ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Haytam. And being from a family which you would think of as prominent or privileged or fancy, depending on how you approach these kinds of structures, found himself in a high government post, having been deeply immersed in study, which was, of course, at that point likely to be, and indeed was, what is now an unthinkable mashup of theology, the physical science, and mathematics, and what is much less unthinkable now, distraught at the intractability of controversies between Shiites and Sunnis in matters important, and resolved to the extent that he could to address questions to which answers actually might exist and might be verifiable, and so undertook to neglect, perhaps, as much as possible his bureaucratic duties in favor of these longer-range questions. The point of crisis for Ibn al-Haytam came when he found himself facing the Caliph of Cairo, a notoriously, how to put it delicately, enthusiastically eccentric and capricious ruler, noted for such creative acts of contemporary performance art as having all the dogs in a town he'd just conquered killed because they barked too much. And the caliph had the expectation, and it was perhaps Ibn al-Haytam's own fault that he did, there's some vagueness about this, that Ibn al-Haytam would be able to engineer what we now know as the Aswan Dam. And according to stories which may or may not be apocryphal, because, of course, the story of this man's life rings so profoundly with the life of any academic who's found themselves at way too many meetings doing way too much administration to think straight and fantasized a decade of solitary confinement as the only possible way they might undertake to actually succeed at the career to which they're committed. Ibn al-Haytam, therefore, found himself in front of the caliph, obliged to say that he could not deliver on this promise for at least a thousand years. And the solution, as it is recorded, is that Ibn al-Haytam feigned madness in order, A, not to put the caliph in the position of finding it amusing to have him executed in some creative way, and B, in order to provide himself with what he had really wanted all along, which was what turned out to be a decade of privacy. Now, this is variously described as prison or house arrest, depending on which version you get. It was a while ago. And during the course of the 10 years between this arrangement being set up and the death of the caliph, thus depriving Ibn al-Haytam, of his imprisonment, he wrote what may have been 92 books. And in particular, he wrote seven books of optics as the first major upgrade 
since Ptolemy's Almagest of about seven or eight centuries previous, and in particular going back to this business of the distress at the factional problem, something about which it turns out academics know a lot, he set himself the task, one, of being skeptical in relation to the literature, two, of producing a methodological rather than factional reconciliation of what they called at the time the physicists, people who would do experimental stuff, and the mathematicians. And left alone, he then more or less formulated what we now think of as the scientific method in which the experiment is not just a demonstration, but a test of an idea about how the world really works. And, of course, combines, on the one hand, rigorous review of the literature, on the other, rigorous definition of very specific questions, and on the third, the business of isolating particular pieces of reality and testing them very specifically and subjecting those physical experiments to rigorous mathematical analysis. The reconciliation of logic and sensation. Now, one of the other bits, and this brought me back to this business of how musicians will tell you that arrangement of musical structures from field recordings was invented by a musician, which happens to have happened about 15 years after it was invented by a filmmaker, and so on and so forth, what I had accepted, as many of us have, as Western science, in fact, depended in large measure on a Latin translation of the 13th century of this optics and its methodology, which were something beyond the state of the art until they were taken up in the 17th century by people like Kepler and Huygens. And so, while on the one hand, I now have a lot more time to actually engage in the broader social creative realm, the question, through the Betaville project that I've been working on with these folks in Bremen continuously, whether indeed communities can be creators, can be artists of their own physical environment. I will also never again use the phrase Western science without remembering the name Abu Ali Al-Hassan Ibn Al-Hassan Ibn Al-Haytham. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's something to aspire to in, in, in solitary is, is reinventing the entire world of optics. Last section of dreams of solitary, the sorts of things that one might do of one might imagine doing if one were in solitary. And we're going to start with Walter Murch, one of the great film and sound editors, and has thought a lot about the qualities of film, sound, and so forth. And so here's Walter Murch. There are two slightly hyperbolic, but only slightly hyperbolic quotes that came to mind when I was thinking about this subject. One is from Blaise Pascal, and the other is from Goethe. Pascal said, all human evil comes from the inability of a human being to sit in a room all by himself quietly. On the other hand, Goethe said, a man can stand anything except a long succession of ordinary days. So the person in solitary confinement is isolated between these two polarities. I clearly have no personal experience uh, of this except tangentially being a film editor Arthur Kessler, who I'm going to read from his uh, book, uh, his experience on solitary confinement, wrote a book, Darkness at Noon, which involved brainwashing. And in the book, he defined brainwashing as being locked in a confined environment under various degrees of stress in an environment where people don't have your best interests at heart with the same material repeated over and over and over again. And if you erase some of the... Uh, precision in the lines, that's uh, sort of what a film editor experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a curious phrase uh, about being in prison, which is doing time. 
it's an odd but apt. I mean, we all know what that means, but when you try to break it down, it doesn't quite make sense. How do you do time? Time doesn't seem capable of being done. But this was the experience of Arthur Kessler, who at that time in 1937 was still a member of the Communist Party, had gone to Spain as a reporter and partly as a spy and was caught and uh, behind nationalist lines and almost killed at the moment he was caught, thrown in jail, thrown in solitary confinement and condemned to death. He wound up spending 90 days in that circumstance. He got out because he was ex there was a prisoner exchange from, from the other side, and that's, that's how he got out. But he lived on a day-by-day -day basis knowing that this day might be his last, that he had no human contact other than the warden, uh, the, the prison guard who would come and bring food to him. And every day in this prison of 1,500 people, 37 prisoners were executed by firing squad. And nobody knew in advance whether that would be you or not. So the, the nightly patrols of who was going to be taken out was a nightly thing that they all endured. He wrote a book about this experience called Dialogue with Death. I'm just going to read a few paragraphs from it because it's a highly perceptive author put in this extremely unusual situation. It's a unique sound. A cell door has no handle, either outside or inside. It cannot be shut except by being slammed. It is made of massive steel and concrete, about four inches thick, and every time it falls, too, there is a resounding crash, just as though a shot has been fired. But this report dies away without an echo. Prison sounds are echoless and bleak. When the door has been slammed behind him for the first time, the prisoner stands in the middle of the cell and looks around. I imagine that everyone must behave in more or less the same way. First of all, he gives a fleeting look around the walls and takes a mental inventory of all the objects in what is now to be his domain. The iron bedstead, the wash basin, the toilet, the barred window. His next action is invariably to try to pull himself up by the iron bars of the window and look out. He fails and his clothes are covered with white plaster from the wall against which he has pressed himself. Indeed, he makes all sorts of laudable resolutions. He will do exercises every morning and he will learn a foreign language. He simply won't let his spirit be broken. He dusts off his clothes and continues his voyage of exploration around his puny realm, five paces by long by four paces across. He tries the iron bed. The springs are broken. The wire mattress sags and cuts into the flesh. It's like lying in a hammock made of steel wire. He pulls a face, being determined to prove that he is full of courage and confidence. Then his gaze rests on the cell door, and he sees that an eye is glued to the spy hole, and it's watching him. The eye goggles at him glassily, its pupil unbelievably big. It is an eye without a man attached to it, and for a few moments the prisoner's heart stops beating. The eye disappears, and the prisoner takes a deep breath and presses his hand against the left side of his chest. Now then, he says to himself encouragingly, how silly to go and get so frightened. You must get used to that. After all, the official's only doing his duty by peeping in. That's part of being in prison. But they won't get me down. They'll never get me down. The daily routine of life, even of life in a condemned cell, cannot sustain for long the melodrama of despair. It banishes the agony to the dungeons of consciousness. From there, it makes itself heard only as a muffled bass drum in the symphony of the daily round and produces a vague feeling of uneasiness. Uneasiness and not unhappiness is the most common form of human suffering. That is, until an acute attack comes on. Then the lock gates give way and the boiling torrent of despair invades consciousness. The onslaught has begun. It's unbearable and one cannot stand it for long. One has to take a pill Every man needs a different pill to help him arrive at a modus vivendi with his misery. The prisoners of Malaga sang the Internationale. I, too, had my pills, a whole collection of various sorts of them, from the equation of a hyperbola 
and my fill of days to every kind of synthetic product of spiritual pharmacy. One of my magic remedies was a certain quotation from a certain work of Thomas Mann's. Its efficacy never failed. Sometimes during an attack of fear, I repeated the same verse 30 or 40 times for almost an hour until a mild state of trance came on and the attack passed. I knew it was the method of the prayer mill, of the African tom-tom, of the age-old magic of sounds. Yet, in spite of my knowing it, it worked. A similar effect to that of these anesthetizing exercises I could obtain by the opposite method, that is, by a sharp abstract speculation. I would start a train of thought deliberately at some given point, such as Freud's theory about death or the calculation of an elliptical orbit. After a few minutes, a state of feverish exaltation was evoked, a kind of running amok in the realm of reasoning, which usually ended in a daydream. After a while, I became sober again and the attack had passed. The healing power of both methods was derived from the same device, that of merging the stark image of the firing squad with the general problem of life and death, of merging my individual misery with the biological misery of the universe. Just as the vibrations and tensions of a wireless receiver, radio, are conducted to earth where they disperse, I had earthed my distress. In other words, I had found out that the human spirit is able to call upon certain aids of which, in normal circumstances, it has no knowledge, and the existence of which it only discovers in itself in abnormal circumstances. They act, according to the particular case, either as merciful narcotics or ecstatic stimulants. The technique which I developed under the pressure of the death sentence consisted in the skillful exploitation of these aids. The astonishing thing, the puzzling thing, and the consoling thing about this time was that it passed. I am speaking the plain, unvarnished truth when I say that I did not know how. I tried to catch it in the act. I lay in wait for it, riveted my eyes on the second hand of my watch, resolved to think of nothing else but pure time. I held it like the simpleton in the fable who thought that to catch a bird, you had to put salt on its tail. I stared at the second hand for minutes on end, for quarters of an hour on end, until my eyes watered with the effort of concentration and a kind of trance-like stupor set in. And what I did not know afterwards was how long a time I had been observing in its passing. Time crawled through this desert of uneventfulness as though lame in both feet, I have said that the astonishing and consoling thing was that in this pitiable state it should pass at all. But there was something that was more astonishing, that positively bordered on the miraculous, and that was that this time, these interminable hours, days, weeks, months, passed more swiftly than a period of times has ever passed for me before. I was conscious of this paradox whenever I scratched a fresh mark on the white plaster of the wall and with a particular shock of astonishment when I drew a circle around the marks to celebrate the passage of weeks and later the months. What? Another week, a whole month, a whole quarter of a year. Didn't it seem like only yesterday that this cell door had banged behind me for the first time? This time problem is the main problem of existence for every prisoner, and not only the prisoner, but of everyone who exists in unnatural, confined conditions in hospitals, in exile. It is truly strange, this will-of-the-wisp time. If we experience time of such a quality that we have to look with a yawn at our watch to count the minutes, as soon as its existence is brought to our consciousness, we may be sure that it will be extinguished in the memory. The only time that is unforgettable is that time during which one forgets that time exists. Only that time is fertile, which remains chaste and unsullied by the touch of consciousness. While I was living down these blank days and speculating upon time, out in the courtyard, outside the window, the courtyard, 37 men were shot, but I did not know it at this time. March 3rd, yesterday the first month of imprisonment is over. I am incapable of visualizing the future at all, concretely, despite constant speculation and forgetting uh, and forging plans. But all plans are somehow dreamlike and unreal. 
All thought more and more takes the form of daydreaming. Whenever the cell door opens, fresh air from the corridor makes me dizzy and I have to hold on to the table. If a warder addresses a word to me, I grow hoarse with excitement. Despite all my feelings of self-respect, I cannot help but look on the warders as superior beings. The consciousness of being confined acts like a slow poison, transforming the entire character. This is more than mere psychological change. It is not an inferiority complex. It is rather an inevitable natural process. When I was writing my novel about the gladiators, I always wondered why the Roman slaves, who were twice, three times as numerous as the free men, did not turn the tables on their masters. Now it is beginning gradually to dawn on me what the slave mentality really is. I could wish that everyone who talks of mass psychology should experience a year in prison. We lived an unusual life in that prison. The constant nearness of death weighed down and at the same time lightened our existence. Most of us were not afraid of death, only of the act of dying. And there were times when we overcame even this fear. At such moments, we were free, men without shadows, dismissed from the ranks of the mortal. It was the most complete experience of freedom that can be granted. Such moments do not repeat themselves, and when one is back on the treadmill of ordinary life, all that remains is the feeling that one has forgotten something in cell number 41. Between the siesta and the evening meal one day, the cell door flew open and freedom was hurled at me like a club. I was stunned and stumbled back into life, just as, had things taken a different course, I should have stumbled into death. As I stood in the corridor, I shook from head to foot, overpowered by the same nervous trembling as on that night when someone outside my cell had called for help. Byron and the newcomer grasp me under the armpits, and after a few steps, I am all right again. I feel the hot sun on my face, inhale a mouthful of air, and then everything suddenly turns gray, green, and black, and I find myself sitting on the ground. At first, I can do nothing but breathe in the air, real air again for the first time, instead of the dense, gaseous mixture compounded of the odor of the stuffy bed, the stale food, and the stench of the toilet on which I have existed for the past months. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. This episode was produced by Micah Hazel. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at nyihumanities.org.